Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome and thanks for logging on. If you love this watch, email me, tmosso at thewatchbox.com. It's in the description below. Your purchase and pricing email question line for buying this or any watch you see on any of our platforms. Please reach out to me directly. Email tmosso at thewatchbox.com for pricing. This watch was an absolute sensation when it debuted. It was released back in 2017 for the model year under $30,000 and with enamel, a flying tourbillon, in-house silicon technology, and true sports watch water resistance. This is the Ulysse Nardin Marine Tourbillon, a watch that literally took breaths away at SIHH when the price of under 30 grand was announced, because this watch has everything. 43 millimeters in diameter and steel, it's only 12 millimeters thick, and 49 millimeters from lug to lug, so that's the distance across the wrist. You put it on the wrist, my wrist is 16 centimeters in circumference, and here you can see it fits really nicely. It's not as broad across the wrist as some UN watches with integrated lugs can be, and you can see just how thin it is, although it's got a bit of a cylindrical and sheer case band, in an absolute sense, it is pretty flat, being a little bit thinner than a Rolex Daytona. I believe you could wear this watch on a wrist as small as 15 centimeters in circumference. You can see the lugs are not quite out to the edge of my wrist on either side, and that down the barrel shot, and there's your over the top, and I am pulling the strap tightly. The strap is fairly integrated, which is why I'm surprised that it fits well on a smaller wrist. Integration of the strap just means that the flow of one in terms of shaping and tapering melds seamlessly into the other. Now you can see the strap is held on by screws and bars, and that on both sides. It's a very secure fixing system that's a little bit more confidence-inspiring than spring bars. 99% of the time, spring bars are fine, but I found that 1% of the time, especially that 1% of the time when the user tries to swap straps himself, that's when disaster strikes. The screws and bars make that much harder to do, so more security against dropping. The strap is large rectangular scale alligator leather. It's a matte finish. It's got a monotone stitch. It's got a folded edge calfskin on the bottom. You can see this is a brand new Ulysse Norden factory strap. No crimping, no gouging. The buckle is a nice looking piece. As you can see, a combination of media blast and polish, and it is a twin trigger release. You have to press both to pop it open. It will not pop open inadvertently. We have a little ceramic spring-loaded pin snaps to maintain the snappiness and tolerances of the clasp over time. Then we rolled the case and you can see it's got a little bit of a a little bit of a concave in its profile. It's not just inverse cylindrical, it actually bows in a little bit. And of course it's designed to evoke the famed Ulysse Norden marine chronometers or navigation clocks that made the company famous during the 19th and early 20th century, which is why we have this general shape, the coining of the bezel, the individual numbering plate held on by fire blued screws and then inked in blue. That's an element from the marine chronometer era. And really here you can see the concave of the case best. It's a difficult thing to capture on camera, but it's there. The crown is polished. It's a screw down. As you can see on the reverse side, no shortage of water resistance, 100 meters. The crown shoulder does have a little bit of rubber on it, so it's easy to grip. And then we have these stubby and satinated crown guard profiles. The bezel is narrow and polished, giving way to a dial in grand faux enamel. UN is special on a couple of levels. Part of that is the capacity for innovation and the willingness to take chances. But part of it's also the willingness to buy up the faculties of production. UN purchased Donze Cadrin, which is their dial factory that makes enamels in particular. And that was in 2012. And since then, they've been able to do various types of enamel from cloisonne to grand faux to multi-part dials. Everything, including Champlevé and all the arts associated with enameling. They've even done a flinke enamel where they have an engraved dial and then a translucent enamel over the top. But this is the most traditional, a white vitreous enamel on a gold base. You start with a paint that's made of glass, that's vitreous, and then through up to 20 firings at 800 degrees centigrade, the glass is melted and smooth and it, it bonds together all the little particles creating almost the appearance of porcelain. It doesn't tarnish, it doesn't oxidize, it doesn't age or fade, and that's the beauty of enamel. Now it can be very difficult to create enamel because the rejection rates tend to be very high. The material can 
crack, it can warp, it can even explode in the oven, and all of this has been known to happen, which is why traditionally enamel is very expensive. And to get high-grade enamel like this, even more so. Now, there's cheap enamel out there. You can get it on a Seiko Presage, but it won't be as smooth as this, and in particular, around cutouts or multi-planar drops, you'll find that the Seiko enamel looks well, it looks its price, whereas this is flawless. The hands are blackened. The watch is a sports watch, though it looks antiquarian. You can see it is loomed, it is automatic, it is steel, and it is 100 meters, so this is a sports watch. The tourbillon is a flying tourbillon. It's a one-minute tourbillon, so one circuit per minute. You can see that the screws fixing the cage together have been blackened, and being a flying tourbillon, there is no upper bridge to block your view of the mechanism. The finishing is quite good. In fact, it's the best finished element of the watch, so the money was spent where you can see it and where you will appreciate it. Now, it has a free-sprung balance, which is great because that's more shock tolerant, but also allows for for tighter adjustments and finer control of timing of the watch. We also have an anti-magnetic silicon hairspring, and I don't know how you could see, well you could see, but just below that, we have a silicon escapement as well. So we have both, now you can see it, you can see that anti-magnetic, fully unlubricated silicon escapement, improving the performance of the watch in between servicings and just as magnetically resilient as the hairspring itself. Get a quick look at the depth of the tourbillon and then turn it over. See the rest of the UN 128 movement. It is a bi-directional winder, and my understanding is this uses a magic lever style bi-directional pole-based winding system. We have high efficiency ceramic rotor bearings, probably a hybrid ceramic system with steel races and ceramic bearings. A lovely multi-finish white gold rotor with a Lovely lacquered Ulysse Nardin logo, blued screws, circular Cote de Genève. You can see solarization on the barrel and engine turning on the base plate. The rotor really is quite nicely done. The bevels are mechanically applied, but handsomely so. All of this with a 60 hour power reserve. It beats away at 4 hertz, so we get a generous power reserve with a tourbillon, and they don't need to cut back the beat rate to keep the power reserve generous. That's impressive. All of this pivots on 36 joules. And of course, it does include a power reserve indicator on the dial side, up and down. If you love this watch, and it's hard not to, manufacture inside and out, UN, through Sigatech, making the silicon, through Donze Catrin, making the dial, and of course, manufacture Ulysse Norden of La Luke, Switzerland, putting it all together. You love it? Reach out to me, Team Also at thewatchbox.com, for pricing.